I think I'm, I'm sure I started in the industry as a person who believed that, you know, the researcher does the research, the designer does the design. Mm -hmm. Over the last 10 years, though, I think my thinking has evolved a bit in that we, I think it's great to have a dedicated researcher and a dedicated designer, right? There's this, this mythology of like a full stack UX person, you know, UX person who can do the research necessary to figure out what to build, then they can design it, and then they can research it, and then they can build a prototype and then turn that into a spec that, that maybe they even build the code for. I think that's a beautiful dream, but it's kind of an impossible goal because it's hard to focus. If you really want to go vertical and be yeah. an expert in these. Yeah, you can't, you can't be an expert in all things and apply them at the same time. So what I find myself now doing and coaching, coaching teammates and also students is to say, you know, research is a team sport. It's really helpful if we have a designer who knows research methods to do some quick evaluations of whether or not their design choices make sense. You don't need to have a fully qualified expert researcher if you're just trying to figure out, you know, should, should this widget go here or should it go there? You don't have to have a PhD to know how to do a usability test. Welcome to Design Drives, your audio experience about what, how, and why design drives things forward. A podcast hosted by Sebastian Gear, together with forward-thinking design practitioners from around the world. In this episode during UX India in Hyderabad, I talk with Steve Fenn, who is head of user research at Google for the measurement and analytics tools, and also a lecturer at UC Berkeley. We talk about the intersection of user research and design, and how both sides should collaborate and intersect during the process of creating or evolving product experiences. Steve shares interesting insights on how to align long-term research that includes topics like behavioral design or cognitive research and short-term feedback, which might be more functional, and how to use data in your design process, which you should just collect if you really act on it. And we also learn why user research actually never stops. Steve is really sharing outstanding insights on how user research, design, and product strategy are all linked. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Sebastian. How are you? Great. I'm really excited to, to talk to you. Actually. Yeah. So we have a, you know, a couple of really interesting topics we're going to touch on. We're here at UX India. You gave a workshop and a full workshop on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. And a talk as well, right? Mm -hmm. So how was that experience? Ah, I loved it. I really enjoy coming to UX India. This is my fifth UX India. Oh, wow. It's, a, it's always a treat to come back. And I think during my talk yesterday, which was about careers, which is different than the, the final presentation I'm giving today, but the talk yesterday was really focused on how practitioners who are new to UX can really present their best self when they're looking for UX career opportunities and also when they're performing in the office or in the work or even in the school environment. One of the things I love about UX India is that people here are so earnest. They're so interested mm -hmm. and yeah. they're so engaged. Mm, and, I noticed um, that. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it seems quite unique. I think it's because of the respect for education as a process, That's as true. well as as well as well design as a process. Mm -hmm. So here it's like the perfect blend. Mm -hmm. You're often in India, right? So five years. Yeah, five yeah. years I've been. Before that, I had never been. Yeah. Oh, before that. So yeah. UX India was your you UX first India. reason to come to India. Yes, UX India was yeah. the catalyst. All right. I think it would be great for the audience to give them a little bit of context <laughs> about your background or what, what are you doing. So maybe I can start with a, you know, a little overview of your journey. Okay, sure. And I'll try to be, <laughs> I'll try to be concise with my answer because my journey is is a bit long. So I'll start at the beginning from the education perspective, which was many years ago. I decided that I would get a PhD and the topic at the time was studying human cognition and perception. It was understanding how people understood text and reading and developed comprehension of concepts. And so that led me in the 1980s and 90s into eye tracking research. And so I did a lot of eye tracking research mm -hmm. uh, during my college years. And while I loved that work, I noticed that I felt a lack of impact. It was basically doing studies to identify theories and to build theories out and understand how the human mind works. And luckily, I did my post-secondary schooling at University of Illinois, and I was next to an applied psychology and an engineering psychology lab. 
And the primary focus in that lab was designing uh, displays for pilots, so head-up displays for aviation, mm -hmm. cockpit displays, air traffic control types of things. And that's where I really discovered that I could take my passion for research and understanding how people think and combine that to the process of design and figuring out how is the best way for me to design a product to enable the best performance for the individual. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, that was 25 plus years ago. Wow. So my journey pretty much started in aviation and aeronautics and then quickly took a turn over into technology and then consulting. And I took a, a six year hiatus working in education where I um, served as a vice president for research and a director for a small consulting group that was part of a college for students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we focused on doing research on students who think differently and have different ability profiles than the norm. And most of my work there was actually related to design because it was about the design of the built environment, design of the academic environment, and design of the career environment so that divergent thinkers and people with different ability profiles could thrive in them. And then after that six years at the college, I came back to technology where I've been ever since and uh, worked at companies like Dell and Salesforce and most recently at um, Google. Mm -hmm. And then you're also teaching, right? And yes, yeah, good, good catch. I've been teaching, gosh, I've been teaching since graduate school. So that's over 20 years of teaching. And I currently teach as a lecturer at UC Berkeley in California. And I'm part of the School of Information. So I'm a lecturer there and I, I teach once a year. So I teach in the spring semesters only because teaching all semesters would be too much of a burden. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be able to really give it what I would need to give it during work. So this feels like the best trade-off for me. Mm -hmm. What are you teaching on? What is it? Uh, That's a great question. I think the easiest answer is if you think about it as user experience research methods, mm -hmm. the primary focus is on the process of design and conceptual development and evaluation and then prototyping and understanding how and whether a product or a service would thrive the way we've designed it. Mm -hmm. And so much of what we talk about in my course is the methods that mostly user researchers bring, everything from the typical usability studies and interviews to surveys and observational protocols and ethnographically inspired methods, and then participatory design methods and ways to do ideation and, and co-design. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the School of Information at UC Berkeley, which mm -hmm. is um, seems to be a, a rising phenomenon. There's a number of schools of information within the United States where we're seeing an intersection of how information is designed, but also the impact of things like information policy, how information is shared, how information is, is delivered, and then also what's the role of research from a data science perspective, and finally, What's the role of how information is presented and communicated to people? So it's all about the role of the human, which mm -hmm. is, I think, something fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you can share out a little bit what is your current role at, at Google? Yeah. So I currently work, I think the, the formal title is Head of User Research for Measurement. Mm -hmm. But basically, I'm a user research manager, and my job is to oversee and hopefully <laughs> help with the strategy in terms of where we see research going with our measurement products. And so these are products where people can understand their web traffic and app traffic and usage behavior and that sort of thing. And the research team that I work with is pretty much all qualitative research. So kind of those user research methods. And then we do a lot of integrations with more quantitative and data science teams as well to triangulate and get mixed methods insights mm -hmm. to help our stakeholders make better decisions. Mm -hmm. How is that, you know, alignment with the, some of the design teams work? I mean, you are sort of like a little bit, I mean, you are, all, I guess, like assumed like horizontally in the whole process because mm -hmm. it's an iterative process. You get yeah. feedback constantly and measure things. Right? So I wonder a little bit about that relationship. Sure, that's a great question. Um, and actually, the, my, my final, my closing keynote today will touch on some of that. And some mm -hmm. of the tension that I see, not so much in, on the team that I'm with, but, but in design and research in general in our, in our community, there's a tension where product managers and product designers and engineers, they want to have answers to questions today, right? They want to know, is my product usable? If I built this feature, is it desirable? Does it, does it fulfill a need? But in the research community, I'm seeing a really strong push toward more what we call foundational insights and strategy. So instead of investing research toward answering a question we know today, 
how can we or how might we invest research to answer questions we don't even know to ask today? Mm -hmm. So, the, and I see that as a struggle because I think many of us in the research domain have been trained to conduct the best method mm -hmm. for the, the answer that we need. And when we think about doing research around strategy and around foundation, that's really more about creating a corpus of knowledge that gives rise to novel insight. I think many of us in the research industry struggle with that. And I think many of our stakeholders struggle with that because they want answers mm -hmm. and they want answers today. And they want to know, should I design it in a certain way? And when we say, oh, sorry, we don't have time for that. Or, oh, we can do that, but we need to also wrap that into an approach where we start discovering information about people's behavioral needs or the way they think or the way they act or the way they might their behaviors might change in five years. That's a bit of a struggle because it feels like a short term versus a long term. And so we're trying to figure out what's the best method to get there. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. You know, I wonder a little bit about you know, in the, um, you also have you know designers you know they come from design side and try to cover a little bit of the research side, right? And then obviously you are full expert in like you know actual like user research and measurement. How do you see you know that you know link uh, link there? Yeah. Maybe we can touch on you know some of the things that. I mean, I guess you appreciate it because, you know, it's sort of like, you know, connecting with you. But, you know, I'm, I assume that you see some of the, you see a, a couple of white spots as well. of like things that, you know, maybe people from the design background maybe don't know as much or, you know, missing or things that would be great if they could improve that, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, it's a, yeah, it's a good point. I think it's interesting when I think about my evolution as a user researcher and also as a manager or a mentor, I think I'm, I'm sure I started in the industry as a person who believed that, you know, the researcher does the research, the designer does the design. Mm -hmm. Over the last 10 years, though, I think my thinking has evolved a bit in that we, I think it's great to have a dedicated researcher and a dedicated designer, right? There's this, this mythology of like a full stack UX person, you know, UX person who can do the research necessary to figure out what to build. Then they can design it and then they can research it and then they can build a prototype and then turn that into a spec that, that maybe they even build the code for. I think that's a beautiful dream, but it's kind of an impossible goal because it's hard to focus If you really want to go vertical and like, yeah. be an expert in these. Yeah, you can't, you can't be an expert in all things and apply them at the same time. So what I find myself now doing and coaching, coaching teammates and also students is to say, you know, research is a team sport. It's really helpful if we have a designer who knows research methods to do some quick evaluations of whether or not their design choices make sense. You don't need to have a fully qualified expert researcher if you're just trying to figure out, you know, should, should this widget go here or should it go there? You don't have to have a PhD to know how to do a usability test, right? And I realize, I think if I think about myself 20 years ago, I might have shuddered at these statements I'm making now. But it's now, I think design and research are a team sport. Mm -hmm. And so the, and, and just like data science and statistics, should be a team sport. We shall understand these things, but we don't necessarily have to be experts in them. And so I think it's wonderful when the designer and the researcher can work together as a team to figure out what should we build and what's the best way to build it mm -hmm. and worry less about what's your role versus what's my role. I think we can get there pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, again, I don't think it necessarily takes an expert to run all the usability studies. It absolutely takes a person with a depth of knowledge in research to understand what might be a better way to frame a question or how to approach a study. But I think the notion that you have to be a deep expert in order to do one specific technique is, is a little bit short-sighted. Yeah. So I see it as a team. It's a team activity. Yeah. Is there one specific skill you appreciate with designers if they have that, you know, if you work with them? That's a great question. You know, on that relationship, I'm, you know, yeah. I want to touch a little bit on that, you know, yeah, I, intersection of research and design. I think I have a simple answer, but I also have maybe a more truthful answer. I mean, the simple answer would be any designer who's willing to get their hands dirty and just start doing some research. I think that's awesome. But behind that is, I think, the real skill or the real talent, which is just curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the ability to ask why and not to say, I know the answer. And so even if you have no skills or exposure to doing research methods, if you're curious about why people do what they do, you can build that really quickly. And so I would say, actually, it's the curiosity. 
that's mm -hmm. probably the, the the key requirement. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How much of your capacity is involved in you know, new features, you know, new you know, new products? Because there's this one side where you know, and then on the other side more the incremental because this is also part of you know user research and feedback. So you know, how do you do? Is it like is it two different teams, mm. almost like two different specialities, oh. or is it like one team that sort of you know, does both? Yeah, that's a great question. I think at most places where I've worked, including you know Google and Salesforce, and also companies like Dell and Intel, there's always a challenge that research teams have to address those short-term questions and those short-term short needs versus those longer-term strategies and foundations. And it would be amazing to imagine having a research team whose only job is to do the short-term work and another team that, whose only job is to do the long-term work. But I think the, the reality is that, first of all, resources are always scarce. And then the second issue is that if the person doing the short-term work isn't part of the long-term work, they're missing out something really critical so to get to your question, I think the biggest, the, the, the fastest answer is you want a little bit of both and it's more of a negotiation with your leadership and your organization to figure out what that division of labor looks like. Maybe it's 75% doing, doing more tactical work and 25% doing more strategic work, where in some other organizations, maybe it's 75% doing that more foundational insights that'll help the company figure out or the organization figure out what to do next or what to worry about for the next five years versus how to build this thing that we have currently had in production for five years, let's say. Mm -hmm. and because, you know, user research can be also part of, you know, product strategy or portfolio strategy, right? So totally. um, like if you, you know, research on a, or measure on a certain product, you could sort of you know, feel like there's almost a need for a sort of other product, mm -hmm. right? Or you see a certain white spot and sort of the, the behaviors. Yeah. I assume that is also something that, you know, happens, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's neat. I think the real opportunity for us in research is to retain that curiosity and also fight. And I think this is kind of an, in, an innate human desire to categorize and separate. In many companies I've worked with or worked in, and many students I talk with, we struggle with this idea of, well, is this research question part of user research? Is it part of data science? Is it part of market research? Is it part of customer loyalty, like customer satisfaction and net promoter score? Who should own it? And part of my talk today is about the idea that we really should think about all of research being a team sport. And while we absolutely need people who are specialized in certain methods and certain approaches, if we're not talking across those lines, we're just contributing to a problem of creating silos. As you talk about measurement, right? If I think about optimization, for example, that's data that's really helpful to a product team, but it also could be data that's really helpful to a market research team, a customer loyalty team, and the user research team that's, wor that's worried about qualitative findings or even quantitative findings, like data that's coming out of this, the statistics. The less we know about what each other are doing, the more at risk we are about injecting problems into our organizations due to that lack of knowledge. You know, it's kind of the, you know, the white spots or the, the, the tunnel vision, the blinders that we have. There's a parable, a parable about the, the blind men and the elephant, right? And so you have these different people touching different parts of the elephant, and then they come up with conclusions. So one person's touching the tail and they say, oh, I'm touching a piece of rope. And another person's touching the ear of the elephant. And it's like, oh, this feels like, like a rubber tree. And none of them have the full picture, so they don't realize they're touching an elephant. I feel like research and design are the same thing. If we focus too much on our silo, we don't have a, a full view of what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if there's like one example where you had the feeling you know, in this relationship of research and design, where you really had the feeling you know, research was empowering design to you know, have a really big impact and drive things forward. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really insightful question. I'm going to not think about my immediate yeah, to yeah, employers yeah. just to keep this vague. Exactly. But I worked on a project where we had a team and the, the goal of the team was to understand how users in a specific environment, in this case it was data centers. So if you can imagine, this is many years ago, but if you can imagine data centers where they have all the servers that have all of your like cloud-based data. And our job was to go out and do site visits and we would spend sometimes multiple days with teams of data center administrators. And we were there, the researchers were there with the designers and the product managers. And at the end of every day, we would do a debriefing session. These were really long days. 
we would do a debriefing session talking about our observations, talking about the questions that were in our minds, and then ideating on the implications. And it was really exciting to see how not only the designers, but also the product managers started sketching out on a whiteboard or on a hotel notepad an idea for how to improve the product. And that was all based on what we had witnessed after one day or one week of observing these administrators in their environment. And I think it was a great example of how you don't have to be a designer or a researcher or a PM in order to have a wonderful insight that will influence the future of your product. So we came up with new features, we came up with new design approaches, and we also came up with ideas for you know A-B tests. We didn't call it A-B tests back then, but we came up with ideas of maybe we should do it this way or that way. Let's try them both. And all of these ideas were generated by insights that came from those direct observations of the people in these work environments. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, when you have that, you know, work with designers, you know, you know, obviously you have, you no, know, it's an iteration, right? So do you propose when is a good time to do another measurement or do another research on a product? Or is that more coming from the design side? Because, I mean, obviously you have a lot of insights there as well. Well, maybe the designers maybe have more opinion in terms of like things that might have changed. So, you know, I'm wondering a little bit about you know, that, about that right time to have a measurement or user feedback. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think... I think most organizations I've worked in, they have this notion of a release schedule, right? Every, every quarter we're going to release new features or every five months or every year we'll have a new product release, right? Many products are cloud today, but, but back in the day when we shipped software, you know, like on a DVD or a CD or a, a floppy disk, there was this opportunity to say, okay, we need to have all of our answers before this point. Mm -hmm. Now with cloud releases are, are more arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And so, almost, you, you, yeah, it's, it's like a constant thing. Right? Totally. Constant it's like we're releases. always releasing. Yeah. And so I think your, your question is, is really interesting because the true answer is all the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Like makes sense. there's no yeah. best Absolutely. time. Although I would say, just like I say to my students, you know, typically the best time is as soon as possible. Yeah. And if your team needs an answer because they're about to release in two weeks, then I'd like to know sooner rather than later. But even if it is later, we can do something. Yeah. It's interesting because I was thinking more of, you know, obviously there's this daily work about this constant research about your product, but I also, I assume like bigger programs, they say, okay, we're actually going to, you know, start a project and like dig deeper into a certain, or do a certain effort to yeah. dig deeper into a certain, you know, behavior. Right? Yeah. It reminds me in, my, in the workshop yesterday where I was really talking about um, designing products for users, for people who, who use data tools, but really are not data scientists or analysts. I talked about some of the methods that we deploy to measure performance. And so, so some of it's much more qualitative, like a usability study or interviews. Some of it's much more quantitative, like setting up a conversion funnel where you basically say, I expect users of the product to go through these steps, A, B, C, D, in order to have a successful experience. So I can just monitor how many people are landing on the homepage, how many people go to this next page, how many people download this white paper or sign up to my mailing list. And those are what we would call a conversion. You can set that framework up anytime, but I think the best time to set it up is while you're designing and concepting the product so you can start understanding this is a critical point in the experience. If we don't have an ideal positive experience, for the customer or the user, then we're going to lose them here. So how do we make sure that this point, this key moment in the journey the user is taking, how do we make sure that's perfect, right? And then there's a lot of post hoc measures. So customer satisfaction surveys, right? Service tickets. So how many customers are logging complaints with the company saying, hey, this isn't working or I can't figure this out. And, and what's the urgency? Is it a priority one? Is it a priority three? And then how quickly are we addressing these problems? And then also things like training. First of all, do we need training, right? I would argue some would say train, having training is a failure because the product isn't truly intuitive. I think the reality is that many products are, are very complex and they require some level of, of onboarding or some level of knowledge. So it ultimately comes down to what's the goal of the research and, and also what's the, what's the pace that my team can act on these findings. I have one counsel that I offer my coworkers, which is we should never put our customers or our users in a position where they are taking on a burden to provide us feedback if we're not going to act on the feedback, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it kills me to see products that are out there today always collecting survey data. I was just using an app this morning and it popped up. In fact, 
yeah, it happens here at this hotel we happen to be at where they just pop up basically a net promoter survey when you're trying to sign on for wireless. Those aren't great opportunities, but I would argue those are also opportunities for the people behind the scenes to fail because if you're truly asking a person at every moment in their experience, hey, how are we doing? First of all, you're biasing the experience. You're making it a crummy interrupted experience. But second of all, how much are they really looking at this data? And if I'm collecting net promoter data, or if I'm collecting customer satisfaction data, or if I'm asking, what could we do better? Literally every moment of every day, I need to have a pretty significant staff looking at those data and acting on them as they come in. Otherwise, if I wait a week, those customers are gone. They've left the hotel. So you want to have a data collection strategy that, that meets not only your needs, but also that can be guided based on your resourcing and what you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. There's a lot of talk these days about like design driving emotions, right? Or you know, can design help you know to drive certain emotions, you know, fulfilling certain emotional needs? There's a lot of interesting work around like how to measure emotions. So I, I don't know if you have you know if I look at your background, I assume that you have a you know, bit of an experience in that regard as well. You know, I wonder like how maybe some of your learnings in terms of like measuring emotions that are actually going to be released by the behaviors and habits that, you know, the product service has. Yeah, that's, it's interesting you ask that. I gave a workshop last year here at UX India on the role of emotions in research and like how different research methods to assess them. Because um, sometimes these things are not on the surface, right? right. So you, yeah. you have to look a little bit deeper and understand like, what is it actually releasing? Yeah. And what a customer says, right? If I give you a net promoter score of two versus four, well, NPS would say I'm still a detractor, regardless of the two or the four, but there's a magnitude difference between a two and a four. And so if I don't understand what the, what the driver is behind that, that's a key miss. So I would say, I mean, we have a number of different ways, right, research-wise, to identify emotion. We could use biometrics. We could look at eye tracking. You could look at pupil diameter to look at arousal, for example. You could look at heart rate. You could look at galvanic skin response, like the sweat gland conductivity. But there's also easier ways. We could look at a person's face and um, see what expressions they're making. There's actually indicators in terms of keyboard speed and mouse behavior, which gives, I mm. believe the term was rage clicking that I heard not <laughs> too long ago. And it's basically, if a person clicks on a website in an area they think is clickable, but it's not clickable, sometimes you might see <laughs> kind of this rapid behavior where they're like, I should be able to click this. It's funny because when I read about it, I was like, no, that can't be possible. And I noticed I did it myself, especially using apps, because apps require really precise finger presses. And so a lot of times I'll press what looks like a button, and I might find myself pressing it 10 times before I decide, okay, that's just a, a design. It's just a design that looks like a button. <laughs> I wouldn't call it rage. But so you can look at the analytics. You can look at the data stream that's coming in to glean some idea of what the emotions are that are driving them. But I think as a, as a true researcher, I have to be true to my roots and say that the only real way to truly know what's going on is we have to figure out how to get inside the heads of our users. And a lot of times you can't do that without observing, without talking, yeah. and sometimes without experiencing what they're experiencing. Yeah, because, you know, I assume like you, know, you can measure certain things, but, you know, sometimes interviews help because, you know, what actually emotion is this, you know, you know product or service like releasing? Is it, you know, creating the, the emotion of meaningfulness? Is it the emotion of feeling related, right? Is it, so I assume there's like a lot of things in it that are, you know, hard to measure just digitally, right? You know, totally. Like you need to talk to to it. You know, to the customer or people and really dig deep, right? Yeah. And if you were doing a usability study, right, you could you could generally figure out whether or not the person in the study is frustrated. Mm -hmm. But it's such a it's such a contrived environment. You have a person, maybe they're in the lab, maybe they're in a remote environment and you're looking at them through a video conference type of connection. You don't really know truly whether or not this is an experience that is relevant to what they do every day. So it's only by watching people every day to see what their emotional experience might be. Also, much of that experience might be below the surface. And like you mentioned, you know, connectedness, like how I feel, what's my relationship to another person or what's my relationship to a product? I think people often don't even know how to articulate that. So even if I asked you, you might not know how to answer. So I have to come up with, we. it's almost like a weird psychology experiment. Yeah. Like, if this product was a person, you know, who would it be? Or a celebrity, right? There's one cool thing that I that I see going on in research quite a bit, which is, you know, the use of methods like diary studies. So you just have a customer, a user, or a person 
write down their thoughts at different periods of the journey, the journey or the experience mm -hmm. journey. And I think if you can create an environment where they're literally like revealing themselves to a diary, they'll then share their, their inner thoughts that give you a better understanding of how they're feeling and how they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Unfortunately, you no know, time is you know uh, ending here a little bit, so we need to wrap it up. Yeah, but there's so much more stuff in there, I'm sure. And just thank you so much for sharing all the fascinating insights. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. This was really wonderful, and um, I look forward to staying in touch and um, finding out what's new for design trends. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. That was the episode. If you want to give us feedback on the podcast, have something to contribute to the next episode, or just want to get in touch feel free to connect with us either on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram messages, or simply via the designdrives.org website. We love to hear from you.